What a mighty God we serve. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Time spent giving adoration today to the Lord through our prayers and through our worship. And it should happen regardless of the circumstances and the things that we face in life. What happens in that process, then you become rooted today and grounded in your faith and you're ready to weather whatever the storms that you face in life may be. So God can cause you to flourish today, even during the difficult transitions of your life, those places of hardness, those places of challenge, those places of, of uh, problems and valleys of life. And what happens that people who flourish in troublesome times of life that we all face then what God does, we have then been set up today to be used for great destinies that God has planned for us. So for every trial that God may permit to happen in your life, God will bring a greater triumph. Amen. Amen. And so we can trust the Lord and bless his name for he and he alone is worthy to be exalted today. Father, we come into your presence, and yes, we do come with thanksgiving. We come honoring you in the name above every name, that adorable, glorious, wonderful name, the name Jesus today. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. How wonderful you are, not only in your creative works. Lord, as we left the house this morning and saw that beautiful sun coming up, oh, how we rejoiced that, Lord, you just was shining the sunlight upon us today, but even greater, it reminded us you're shining that sunlight of love upon our lives today. And I just pray for your mighty outpouring of your spirit in this place today. I pray that hearts will, Lord, be drawn to Jesus today. I pray for the sick that you will lift them up. Lord, touch them, heal them, and encourage them. I pray for the broken. I pray today for those who have just suffered recent loss. We pray for Roy and his family and the passing of his sister that you will comfort them in that hour and that time of need. We pray for those who are in the hospital today. We think about Melissa, that, Lord, you will touch her and just pray that as they do a catheterization tomorrow, we pray for great results and just pray for your hand of divine, glorious healing and your, that only you can provide to Melissa's benefit. Her trust, her faith is anchored in the Lord, and, God, you're going to honor her faith by touching her and healing her. And then others today that are going through times of sickness and trial, we pray for them. We pray for Max. He's having some problems this morning with dizziness, and Lewis has been sick with uh, some bronchitis, and others have been going through some issues in their lives of sickness. And I know that many have faced flus and just a host of things. But God, we come today knowing that you're in control and place everything in your hands, and we're here to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. May our worship be pleasing in your sight. May you be glorified. May you, may you be honored today. And Lord, we're excited about the Lord and Lord, what you're going to do. May a heart be drawn to Jesus today. May a burden be lifted. Lord, may a heart be encouraged. May someone just turn everything over to you today. May your spirit have freedom in our church and our lives, in our homes and in our communities today. And we'll give all the praise to you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To God be all honor today. For it's in that glorious name we do pray. The name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And all the church said, Amen.
friends down through the years that seemed to have it all everything the world could bring they always had a ball when the party ended and the bills were coming due high life wasn't high enough to help them make it through what you need isn't silver or gold wealth or fame or riches untold if you're searching for some kind of peace the world doesn't have it i'll tell you what you need you need jesus like I got Jesus, you need Jesus, that's what you need. You need Jesus, I got me Jesus, you need Jesus, that's what you need. And every time I turn around, just say the Lord, you get it. The world says I can always buy through happiness on credit. You can have your limousines, vacation homes, whatever. Wealth and fame are just a game. I need something better. What we need isn't silver or gold. Wealth or fame or riches untold. If you're searching for some kind of peace, the world doesn't have it. I'll tell you what you need. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. I got me Jesus. But that's what we need. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Got me Jesus. That's what we need. What we need is more than the world can give. Yes, it is now. What would come out here to say that He's the only way to live? We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Got me Jesus. That's what we need. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Got me Jesus. That's what we need. In the morning. In the night time, any hour is the right time. You need Jesus, I need Jesus. We need Jesus, we need Jesus, we need Jesus. He's oh, we really, really gotta, gotta have a need. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
express the love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. coming down greet folks hug next let folks know you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord today and hi everyone so glad that you're with us here at Gethsemane Baptist Church I pray you're mightily blessed of the Lord may he today just bless you exceeding abundantly as Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians today God has everything under control in this world that is very chaotic and confused I'm glad he's still on the throne Today we're back in the book of Genesis chapter 18 and we're dealing with the subject effective prayer. So stay tuned for the message and let me invite you to come right here to this church and worship with us. We're easily conveniently found 411 Blue Ridge Street right here in the heart of Lynchburg. Come on over for a great blessing. Good morning, brother. We'd love to see you. Now, Enjoy the message, the music, and may your heart be encouraged today. And I pray that you know Jesus as your personal Savior. God bless you. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will be home. Soon the pearly gates will shall tread the street of gold it's when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory it's when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all Jesus will sing and shout the victory when we all, when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory. I believe he's worthy of our praise this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm going to heaven. One day we're going to see that street of gold. But more importantly, one day we're going to see our Savior face to face. Now we see through a glass darkly. We go through troubles, challenges, and problems in life. But one day, oh, that's going to be history, and we're going to see Jesus face to face. Won't that be wonderful? Hallelujah. We're going to go back. Let's sing that last verse again. Pearly gates are opening. We're going to see the Lord. That's enough to make a Baptist shout. Amen. Onward to the prize before us. His beauty will be whole. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of in the house of the living God. Amen. Amen. 
Lord, I'm tired of hiding, lost in all these tears, trying to carry all this pain alone. I've been as strong as I can be, now only you can rescue me. Now I'm stepping out in faith to fall into your sweet embrace. Trusting you, I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you alone. Trusting you, I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you alone. Jesus, I surrender. Take me to your heart, fill this emptiness inside of me. Cause it's your love and nothing less that can heal my pain and brokenness. All I am, Lord, all I have, I place my life into your hands. Trusting you. I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you alone. Trusting you, I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you alone. Place this life into your hands. Trusting you, I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you alone. Trusting you, I'm trusting you, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you, trusting you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Trusting you, trusting you, I'm trusting you. We're going to digest into our spirit the Word of God and let that Word then change us today. I'm dealing with today on the subject of effective prayer taken from Genesis chapter 18. We'll, we'll be reading from verse 16 down through verse number 21. And a good morning again. I'm, I'm so delighted that you're here in God's house and I pray that my desire for you is today that you will be blessed and encouraged and enlightened by the, by the glorious Word of God. I want to make a statement today that I, I hope you won't forget. And that statement is this. Don't tolerate prayerlessness in your life. You really do not need to tolerate prayerlessness in your life because let me tell you, if you don't pray, you're weak. And you're not talking to God. You're not trusting God. You're not in true relationship with God because your prayer life is not in tune with God. So don't tolerate prayerlessness in your life. And you know what's so neat about prayer? You can pray any, any place, any time, and you can call upon the Lord. Not only that, but I have a second one for you today. Don't let stress of life, we all have stress, don't we, in the church said amen. Don't let stress of life dictate how much time you spend at the feet of Jesus. And so therefore, we become so consumed with ourselves and our problems and our issues and our stresses and 
There's so many things that just absolutely drive us down that we become so consumed with that that we don't, we don't really spend any time with the Lord. Let me tell you, your quickest way out of your stresses of life is to spend time with God. And you'll be amazed of how God can mightily work in your life and do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. R.A. Torrey stated this, and he basically gave us two great secrets to effective prayer. And, of course, those things include this. Number one, he says, study the word of God and find his will as revealed in his promises. If you're excluding the word of God from your prayer life, you are excluding the very key to your prayer life. You really need to spend time. Uh, my time of prayer, often I spend it that I'm talking to the Lord. I'm reading his word out loud to him. I'm claiming his word and his promises, his provisions. And it's amazing how that gives you assurance and help and grace in those places and times of your life. So you've got to involve, first, the, the word of God in your prayer life. Secondly, today, he said, take these promises, those promises that are in God's word, and spread them out before God in prayer with the unwavering expectation that he will do what he said. So that's exactly what I was telling you. That you need to take God's word to prayer with you and you need to claim those promises of God. God's not offended today. Many times we think, well, when you pray, you got to bow your head and close your eyes. And if you don't, God's going to crack you over the head with a two by four. Well, he's never cracked me over the head yet with a two by four because I did that. Because as many times I prayed with my eyes open and I was praying with the word of God in my hand and I was reading it before the Lord and claiming his word before him. See, it's not that we're questioning God. It's just the fact that we're believing God and we're saying, God, I believe what you said in your word. So therefore, that whatever is going on in my life, your word is applicable to that and I can trust you to meet that need in my life. See, folks, your prayer life is important to your life tonight. It's just not the fact that you show up for church. But listen, you should be spending time excessive time in prayer and especially today in these days in which we're living we need to make sure that our hearts our homes our lives our church our community is ready for the lord amen we need to pray for our leaders today i mean now uh, governmental leaders we need to pray for our president who is constantly under scrutiny and complaint uh, we need to pray for those who are in the Senate and the Congress. We need to pray for those in our local governments, our state governments. We need to pray for those today that are in authority over us. We need to pray for our church, our people, our community. We need to pray for everything. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher. All of a sudden, I was just kind of praying for my four and no more. And, you know, I was just praying for God to bless the food and, and, and start the day off right. And that was about it. And probably your prayer life lasts for about 30 seconds a whole day long. Hello, y'all. That doesn't work. Sure, you're to pray for your food and you're to pray for your four and even more. But understand this. You're to pray about everything. Paul said to pray without ceasing. The effective, effectual fervent prayer, he said, of a righteous man. But when he said that, he was speaking of the gender of persons. He was saying the, effect, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous, a right living person with God will make much happen or will avail much. You know why we don't see things happen in our lives? We don't pray about it. You know what we use prayer for? The ripcord when the parachute won't open. That last opportunity, that last rush of adrenaline, of a panic that we have in our lives, we think, well, I've tried everything. Why don't you start trying prayer on the front end instead of on the back end of it and see what God can do in your life? Let's read the Word of God. Let's stand for the reading today. We're picking up in Genesis 18, verses 16 through 21. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. Oh, Lord, that, that right there is shouting, ground. I mean, for you and I, God knows us. There's no secret agendas with God. There's nothing done in secret that God doesn't know about it. God knows even the thoughts and the intents of our heart. So he says, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring 
uh, upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is to which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. May God bless his word today to your heart and your life. You may be seated. Could it be that most of us in this room today do not pray very well? As I said, we use prayer as a last resort. We even pray with skepticism. We pray with doubt. And we pray, well, God, if you can, God, if you will, if there's some way that you can work it out. And we use all those phrases and terminologies today to, to basically, we just salt our prayers with negativity and no wonder God doesn't answer our prayers. You've already defeated the purpose of your prayer even before you started. So therefore, you can't pray with, oh, wait, listen, you can't pray without believing. You can't pray without trusting. You can't pray without putting your confidence in what God's word says. And you can't pray effectively without God's word lodged into your life. So it's important today that we involve the Word of God in our life. We have prayer lists. We share prayer concerns. We, we can use the, the Facebook cartoon hands to let people know we're praying for them. I would be interested in just wondering, don't raise your hand, but when we throw that stuff on Facebook and people put all their issues and problems and sicknesses and trials and all this stuff, and the first thing, man, we, we can't wait. We want to be the first one that makes the comment and says, I'm praying for you. Is it just a comment or is it really a prayer? See, I'd rather you pray for me and not concern yourself so much with that and put the comments on there. I'd rather you spend that time praying for me. Amen. And it's not, don't, 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 they don't get, well, he's being, you know, he's just throwing a wet blanket on. No, I'm not. That's fine and dandy. You do that, that's fine. I do it too. But the fact of the matter is, do, here's my question. Do we really do what we say that we're doing? If we're telling somebody, I'm praying for you, have you taken time after you posted those few words to bow your head and to say, God, a uh, special need, that problem, that issue, that person, what they're going through, what they're facing, whatever it may be, their family, whatever it may be. Folks, listen. I mean, we had this great event, horrible event, to, tragic event that happened in Florida, and I saw so many posts about people praying for them. Did we really pray for those families? See, it's not... The motion of saying we are, it's the intensity of our prayer life that makes the difference. It's not what comes out of our mouth for people. It's what comes out of our heart towards God that makes the difference. And if we're not praying, then, folks, if we're telling people we're praying for them, if I tell Hunter, I'm praying for you, Hunter, and I don't do it, I just lie to that man. And I have really done him a disservice. Honestly, the Word of God says, I've sinned against him. Because I told him I was going to pray for him and I didn't do it. So in essence, I've lied to him. I've lied to God. And that's wrong. You said, you're really straining the net here, preacher. Well, maybe we need the net strained a little bit. Maybe we really need to examine our prayer life and to see if we're really that effective today. Listen, we, we don't have to be, we don't have to have hordes of people today to actually pray. I mean, if you spend time with God alone, that's some of the best prayer time that you can have in your life. We have the ingredients for the fire, but we don't have the fire itself. So therefore, the fire of God that makes the, the heart burn for the gospel. We need to be people of prayer. This young man is going to be leaving and going to an area that potentially has a lot of intensity going on. We need to pray for Cody. We need to cover him in prayer every day. We need to pray for God's hedge of protection and for God to watch over him and to mightily use him. See, God is in his providence and, is, and he's brought us today to this portion of scripture found in Genesis 18. In Genesis 18, we have a recorded conversation between Abraham and God. Now, we understand who Abraham is, are we learning? And we know the Bible declares that he's a friend of God. He's a man of faith. God mightily used him. We've seen some of the things that's happened in his life. We still have yet things to see. But this passage comes from an, an, an imperfect man. Regardless of what you may think, Abraham was not perfect. 
He was not a perfect person. And by the way, neither are you and I perfect today. We are not perfect people. We may think we are, but we're not. And so therefore, he was an imperfect man of faith that knows he needs God. He knew that he needed God's presence in his life. So a fundamental question then comes today to us, do you know that you need God? Honestly today, you say, well, I, I just trust the Lord. I, I, I need the Lord. But see, we use the, the words, but we don't apply the action. We need the Lord, God, every day. We just don't need him when it's raining in our lives, trial and trouble. You need him for the sunshine days just as well as for the troublesome days. You need him every day. You need him every hour of the day. Come on, church. You need God in your life. You need to rely upon him. You need to trust in him. You can't do anything, but if you have the attitude of Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, you can see God then literally move in your life and bring about great things in your home, your family, your life, your church, and your community. Amen. See, your prayer life is just not entailed to the circle of you. Your prayer life goes beyond you. It's vitally important that we are people of prayer. So today we've got to understand and know that we need God in our life. Abraham prayed on what he knew about God's integrity and what he knew about God's character. And you're never going to know the integrity of God if you don't study him and learn of him and walk with him. You will never know the integrity and the character and the reputation of God until you experience him in your life. Amen. So we reverse it because we pray on what we basically know about ourselves and what we think that we need. I mean, really, we spend a lot of our prayer time in telling God need after need after need, right? But actually, you don't know anything about yourself or you don't know as much about yourself as you thought God knows far more about us than we know about ourselves. Our prayers need to be cries of trust today to a God who is holy and who is good. And so therefore, that means today that we love today God, we love his people, we love his kingdom, and we love his word, and we love what God's trying to do in our life, amen. We need to become better at our prayer life, hallelujah. I know some of you are sports enthusiasts. You may like baseball, football. Some of you are all keyed up about your race car driver today, whether they're going to take a right turn into the wall or take a left turn into the pits. I mean, you know, you're hoping that they're going to be the one that's going to cross the finish line. Then today there's, you know, you maybe like basketball. And maybe you like today other means of sports. And you think, man, these guys are so, these gals, these people, it's just not the guys, it's the gals too. They're so good. Maybe some of you have been watching the Olympics. I actually flipped over last night and tried to give it another chance. And, and, and they were doing this thing on a little board. And they were going down a steep slope. And they was jumping up on rods and rails and things and this. And I thought, holy mackerel. If I tried that, they would just have to gather the pieces and haul it off. <laughs> it wouldn't be much left, amen. And I, and I watched that and I thought, how did they get to be as good as they are at what they do? You know, practice. I saw one American guy and he scored a 90 point something or another. And in his final finale, when he got right down to the end of the track, and you're doing all this stuff, and you're going up over this and down under this, and you're flipping, you're turning. And he did, I mean, he went up in the air, and I thought, oh, my Lord. Spin, turn, flip, spin, turn, flip, spin, turn, flip. And he did like a triple, whatever you would call it. I don't know the terminology. And I thought, oh, my heavens alive. This guy is really good. And he scored high. I don't know what the end result was because I said it's time to go to sleep. Squirt, we're going to bed. Cut off the lights, go to sleep. But anyway, the, the point is, in order to be effective and to be there in South Korea and doing what they're doing, whatever team they may be, they've had to put a lot of work. And they had to perfect that talent that they've got in athletics. Now, it's just not reserved to athletics. It's reserved to anything in our life. Whether your jobs, it's you're good at what you do. And, and, and so realizing this, we should really be good and we should become better in our prayer life, amen. We need to be more effective in our prayer life. We need to spend time in prayer. 
If it was necessary for Jesus, and listen, this is the very Son of God, to spend time in prayer where he spent much time apart from his disciples praying, then is it more of a necessity? Is it more today? Is it, is it really something that we need to be doing more in our life when it comes to our prayer life? It becomes an, an, an imperative. It becomes today a priority. It becomes a part of us. It becomes something that we're doing every day. Not something as a bailout prayer, but something that we trust God every day for what our God can do. We need to become better in our prayer life today. Abraham's going to show us what effective, effective prayer really looks like. Let me say this before I give you a couple points. Effective prayer means really talking to God. Effective prayer means really talking to God. Not some little prayer that you can tuck back in the back of your Bible that you read through. Not the prayer of serenity. Not the prayer that somebody else has written. Prayer comes from the heart. And you need to be effective in your prayer life today. You need to start talking to God more. You need to spend more time in God's presence and talking with him and calling upon him and believing in him and trusting in him. Amen. Let me give you the first point. To talk to God, you've got to know God. To talk to God, you've got to know God. So Abraham and Sarah, they have met with God. Now remember where they are. Abraham's around 100. She's in her 90s. And God said, you're going to have a baby. And they said, ha, 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 ha. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. So they've met with God, and God has told them that he's going to give them a son. Come on, God. And it's no way. So verse 17 says, And the Lord God said, shall I, hide, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation in all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. See, actually in verse 18, it's actually a direct prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So that being the case, Abraham serves to do something here. Get this in your, in your scope today. Abraham serves to point us to Jesus. Amen. As a matter of fact, the entirety of this book points to one. And his name is Jesus. His name is Wonderful, Counsel, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He's everything you'll ever need. He's everything in salvation. He's everything that today your heart will ever desire. He will supply your every need. He'll be a friend that will stick closer than a brother. He'll bring you through every storm. He'll supply your every need. You'll find in him everything that is necessary for living and even beyond that because when life is all over and you're not living in this body anymore, thank God you got a better place to go. Amen. All because of Jesus. Amen. That's what we have in him, thank God. So when you get to Genesis 18, 19, God opens up his grace to us. So you really, oh, you say, well, there's no grace in Genesis. Oh, yes, it is. Because Jesus is there. It's got to be grace there. So we need to grasp this word, G-R-A-C-E. What does it spell? Grace. What is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. We are saved by God's grace. Ephesians tells us, Paul says, for, you, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So Abraham was called the friend of God. You know why? You know why he was called the friend of God? Do you know why he was called the friend of God? Do you know why he was called the friend of God? Why? Because, why? Why? Because Abraham knew God. That's why he was called the friend of God. He knew God. You know, that wasn't reserved. That's not an exclusive thing just for Abraham. You know today, you can be a friend of God too. Because you know God. Amen. Well, I know there is a God. It's more than that. There's more than just knowing there's a Bible, just knowing there's a heaven, just knowing that there's a God, just knowing that there's a throne. You can know God. A lot of people have the idea and the mentality today, well, God is mysterious and nobody. Nobody can know God. Who told you that? Because today, the more you're in his word, the more time you're in prayer, the more that you walk with him, the more time you spend with him, the more you get to know him. Amen. It's the same thing in your relationships with your family, with your friends. 
with people who are in your life, the more time you spend with them, the more that you, what? Get to know them, right? Amen. So how did, how did he know God? He knew God the same way that you and I know God. And let me give you some points here real quick. We know God by grace. And that's crucially important. The glory of knowing God is that God sees us. He sees us in our sinful condition. And he loves us in spite of it today. So the doctrine of grace, which is a doctrine in God's word, teaches us that we are not changed by getting ourselves right to earn God's affection. I hear people all the time say, I'm going to get myself straightened out. You can't do it. You can't get yourself straightened out. Only God today can change your life. So it's not about you doing it. It's about God doing it. Amen. See, when we do it, that's why we keep staying in the same mess like we are. It's because we're trying to do it. We're turning over new ideas and new leads in our lives. And, and, you know, probably some of you that made New Year's resolutions, you broke them two hours after the new year began. Amen. So realizing that it's not about us doing the right thing, for, for God loves us, and it's about God has already done the right thing. It's about you receiving the right thing that he's already provided. So God comes to us to show us our sin. What is that? The fact is that God's grace is sufficient. Thank God you cannot sin that God can't forgive it. Amen. So we are sinners. We are sinners. And we need him. You're never going to come to any realization of God until you come to the realization of who you are. And even after salvation, we're still sinners, but glory to God, we're sinners saved by grace. And if, and if 1 John 1, 9 then becomes applicable because we still sin, maybe not willfully, intentionally, and habitually, but we still sin. But thanks be unto God that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I don't know about you. I think I do know about you because you're like me. You need daily cleansing. All of us do because we're still sinners. Just because you got saved doesn't mean now you're perfect. You're not. I hate to bust your bubble. I'm sorry. You thought you was all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> but you're not. If you're saved, thank God you're a sinner saved by grace. So God takes us to the cross of Jesus, and that's where he paid our sin debt. So you can't leave the cross out of grace. Amen. Say it again. You cannot leave the cross out of grace. Amen. Amen. And then, through grace, he adopts us. I'm adopted. But I'm treated like a son. Because God's made me a child of the king. Amen. I didn't come into this world a child of the king. But man, when he saved my soul, he made me a child of the king. And thank God he doesn't kick you out of the family, man. He's put his mark. He's put his name. He's put it all on us today. And we got reason to rejoice. Are you saved today? You've got reason to rejoice. Give the Lord a praise in this house today. See, Jesus brought grace for us at the cross. He paid it in full. There's nothing you can add to it. If you're saved, thank God you are saved. Amen. And there's nothing, no power, nothing today that can snatch you out of God's hand. Amen. Because you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Stop wrestling with what God's already settled. And stand on what God has said. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not for a day, not for an hour, but for eternity. Amen. Amen. I'm a firm believer in that. And friend, let me tell you, Jesus, he bought grace at the cross. He paid the debt in full. I had a debt I couldn't pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. He paid it all for you and I. Freedom is you being adopted in Christ through the power of the cross that brings the grace of God to you. Second little bullet today. We know God by discipline. Oh, that's a tough word. I hated it when I was a kid. And I still hate it today to some degree. I hate it, discipline. And I tell you, the greatest discipline I ever got to really straighten me out was when I went in the military and the shock treatment that I got. Some of you got that too. 
I'm talking about a different kind of discipline there. But then when you come to Christ, he has put a different type of discipline in your life today. We know Christ by discipline. God's grace is coming to us and saving us. Thank God for that. But discipline is you and I. See what your discipline is? See, we, we associate bad with that word, but actually it's good because discipline is you and I following Christ. That's what it all boils down to, following Jesus today. We're called into the rigors of discipleship today. So you go back to verse 19, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So after grace is discipline. Friend, I'm going to tell you, this is the picture. I know it's not a popular word, and I know it rubs against your flesh, but this is a picture of you following Christ with all of your might. Now, how are you following Christ? So far off? Or are you just lagging behind? You know, you ever seen people that just can't seem to get in rhythm? They just can't seem to get in the pace. They can't seem to get on top of things in their life. And they're always falling behind. They're always getting behind. That's not what God wants for you. In your spiritual life, if you follow Christ, you will stay with Christ. Amen. You will keep up with what God's trying to do in your life. Let me give you a New Testament version of that. In Philippians 4, uh, 3.13, he says, forgetting those things. See, too many of us are living in what happened and used to be and what we used to be at and what we used to do. Now that's gone under the blood of Jesus Christ. All gone, forgiven and forgotten. You need to get over it. Amen. So forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Stop living where you used to be. Start living where God's taking you. Amen. You've got to, you've got to seek to resist temptation. And so this is you today dropping the excuses today. And you've got to start practicing a word that you're not going to like, but it's called self-denial. You've got to deny yourself. Jesus denied himself, took up the cross, and praise God, he went all the way. You've got today to deny ourselves and take up the cross, as the scriptures tell us, and follow Jesus. Amen. See, following Jesus is just not saying, I got a Bible, hallelujah. I come to church sometime. I pray occasionally. That's not following Jesus. Following Jesus is every day, all the time. It's a full-time thing. You've got to follow Jesus. Amen. In all areas and all aspects of your living today. So does, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you self-denial is easy. I'm going to tell you right up front. Self-denial is tough. But it will toughen you up for the cause of Christ. What this does then when you go into the... You start praying and say, God, help me to really get into self-denial. And help me to follow you. I'm going to tell you right now, you've got, you got a problem. You've got a big problem on your hands. And it's not your husband or your wife or your kids or your neighbors or your friends or your co-workers. Your problem there is you. Because you don't like that. And you tonight or today is going to be, you're going to be in internal warfare. How can you actually know God if you can't? How can you really know God and not deny yourself? But see, we've, we've been groomed and we think, well, to follow God and to deny self is, is a... It's a drudgery. It's a rut. It's too hard. No, it's not. See, you've listened to what everybody else has said. Self-denial is following Jesus, and that's where victory and blessings are found. See, you're robbing yourself. Did any of you leave a note in front of your house on the yard saying, we're not home today. Come on in and steal everything you want. As a matter of fact, I left the door unlocked for you. Anybody do that? I hope you didn't. It's the same thing that you're doing in your life. When you're not living in self-denial, you basically are advertising yourself for Satan to hit you with everything to, to lure you away from God. I don't even put where I'm at. Oh, I know some of y'all do, and it's your choice. I'm not going to tell anybody I'm not home and say, come on in and steal everything. Of course, I got a man-eating dog. <laughs> and if as they're coming up the steps to get up on the upper level, 
and they see those teeth in that mouth, I guarantee you they'll put a new door in that house getting out of there. <laughs> Folks, you cannot know God if you're not denying yourself. And it's not a negative, it's actually a positive for our spiritual life today. How can you be captivated today by the beauty of Christ? How can you today really bask in the forgiveness of the cross and not deny yourself? How can you have really the joy of the Lord and not deny yourself? It's not robbing yourself. It's actually blessing yourself. It's getting the garbage out and it's getting the good stuff of God in your life. Amen. If you're constantly today swayed by the... And this is what happens to us Christians. We, we are swayed by the fool's, goals, uh, uh, the fool's gold of this world of thinking the world offers us more. The world doesn't have nothing for you. God's got everything that makes a difference in your life. I, I want to call you back this morning to the joyful, intense freedom that today of giving yourself over to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to do an Isaiah experience. You've got to say, here am I, Lord Send me, use me, help me, bless me, make me a blessing, amen. We know God by his grace. We also today know God by our discipline of living for him. And the third little bullet is this, and I'm almost through. We know God by trusting in his plan. Do you know what God's plan, God's plan was just not seven days a week, I get up, I go to work, I take a shower, I eat, I go back home, I go to bed, and you do this routine, your life has become nothing but a rut, and a rut is nothing but a grave with both ends kicked out. And if you're living in a rut, and I tell you, the, the devil likes to keep you in a rut. Today is your day to get out of the rut. Today is your day to really get free. You need to get into God's plan because God's plan has never been a rut for you. God's plan has been righteousness for you. So God chose Abraham or chooses Abraham and God's working through Abraham. Why? To bring about his plan in his, in his kingdom. And God wants to use you for his kingdom to work out your, his plan in your life. So God has a plan for you. Nudge your neighbor and say, God's got a plan for you. And his plans are not like the plans that you and I have. We think we got it all mapped out. No, you don't. Our plans, most of all the time, depend upon some outside factor that's going on within our life that we cannot control. This is not so when it comes to God. There are no outside factors when it comes to God. The God... Listen, God wants to control and bless your life. And today when you're trying to worship your authority over God, you are robbing yourself or denying yourself of the plan of God of what God wants to do. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. And God will bless you when you turn your life over to him. So this is what the New Testament tells us about being in Christ. So let me give you a New Testament application. Ephesians 2 and 10 says, For we are his workmanship. Oh, hallelujah. Created in Christ. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Before you was, God knew that you would be. And you know what? Even before that, God knew what his plan was for your life. You need to learn to obey God in his leadership. Let me give you another one. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident, assured, no doubt, confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you, praise God, he's began the work, that in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So in Christ, God has chosen you, God has purchased you, and he did it by the blood of his son. Therefore today in Christ, God loves you today with an everlasting love, the day that cannot de diminish or cannot be removed. God loves you today, amen. And God loves you so much that he wants to involve his plan. We are not worthy of God's plan, but I'm glad God in his grace and love and mercy included us in his plan. That we can live for God. There is no other way to live, church, but to live for God, amen. In Christ, he's forgiven you. In Christ, he's cleansed you. In Christ, he's accepted you. And you can be assured, assured today, if you're not in Christ, God does not accept you the way that you are. It's not your good works that gets you there. It's God's grace that gets you there. So in Christ, he's accepted you. Aren't you glad? 
We are, as the scripture declares, we're accepted in the beloved. And he is the beloved. God's working through prayer. He's working through his own providence, his own plan. And you know what? You can trust God. Amen. Part of knowing God is to trust God. And prayer is us talking, as I told you, to God. If you can't talk to God, you don't know God. Bluntly. You don't know God if you can't talk to him. Oh, I got the second point. I haven't given you that one, Heather. When you know God, you understand the problem of sin and judgment. This is short. When you see God in his holiness, you understand your sinfulness. You also grasp and understand what you deserve. So if you look back for the sake of time, I won't take you back to it. Verse 20 and 21. See, God has an intimate knowledge of our sin. We think we can get Bible stuff. We can cloak stuff. I tell people, I said, these, these people that go out and commit crimes and rob, steal, and, and do things like that and kill people and shoot people and all the other crazy things that they do, that's not the dumbest thing you can do. Because in today's environment, the forensics being as they are, you, you can't get by. And actually, you shouldn't want to get by. If you're living right, you shouldn't want to be living beneath, beneath or living outside and thinking you can do anything you want to do. You can't do anything in your life that God doesn't see it, that God doesn't know it. Scripture says he even knows, he even has your hairs numbered on your head. You say, well, I don't have any hair. He, he knows how many freckles you got too. He has an intimate knowledge today. God's not ignorant today of anything, and he's not ignorant of sin. So God hears the cries of the oppressed, the abused, of the forgotten, and there's not one single sin that has failed to cry out to God for judgment. I want, I want to show you something. One more thing here I want to show you. Every sin has a voice. Every sin has a voice. That voice cries out to heaven. And honestly, that voice of sin cries out for judgment. Because that's what sin should receive. That's the judgment of God. And if you're not in Christ, realizing that all your sins come together before God is some foul choir calling out to God, exposing your sin. You, you're not hiding nothing. Your sins are crying out. Your sins cry out before God. And where your sins cry out before judgment, Jesus on the cross cried out for your mercy. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's good news today, amen. For we broke the covenant. But Jesus now becomes, there's only one mediator, as Paul said to Timothy, only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus, amen. So Jesus is the, me, the new mediator. He is the new covenant. There's no approach to God apart from him. You can go to confessionals and pray to a priest that can't do anything for you. You can tell your friends, and you can even feel sorry for your sins, but until you confess them to God and get them right with him, they're not going to be forgiven. Bottom line. Hebrews 12, 24, and, Jesus, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that's, that speaketh better things. Better things for what? Better things because that means today that word we can be forgiven. And folks, maybe there's needs in your life today. Maybe there's sins that you need forgiveness for today. God raised Jesus from the dead. And what he was doing, he was declaring forgiveness for any person that would trust in Christ. That's what he did. That's what it was about. He was declaring forgiveness for any person that would come to him to talk to God. Oh, listen today. You've got to know God. And friend, if you're not saved, you need to come and receive him. And if you are saved, you need to come and say, Lord, help me to pour more of my life into your care and your attention. 
Real prayers begin at the cross of Jesus Christ. Have you been to the cross? Are you a prayer person? Are you really effective in your prayer life? Have you taken God's word literal and what he says? For all your struggles you're facing, you can come to the cross. Everyone sitting in this room, I guarantee you, every one of us in this room, we've got struggles in our lives. Your life is not free from it, as none of us are. But aren't you glad that you can come and talk to God because of what he did at the cross for you and I? His love, his forgiveness, and his plan is all found in Jesus Christ at the cross. I encourage you. I plead with you. Come and talk to him today. Pour your heart out. Pour your discipline out. Seek his direction. Get his forgiveness. And leave here today with the intention, the purpose in your heart. You're going to live for God. Abraham was a great example for us. But we have to glean what he has provided to make us effective for the kingdom of God. If you're unsaved, come, let us pray with you. If you've got struggles, come and pray. If you just want to come and thank God, that's the greatest prayer you can pray for all the blessings he's bestowed upon you. Father, right now in the blessed name of Jesus, you know the need of every heart and every life in this room. And we know that you can meet that need you can hear those prayers. You can hear those calls. You can change those lives. And as we stand to our feet and as the music begins today, there's a call to an altar. Oh, God, today our sins cry out. Cry out, we need forgiveness. We need cleansing. We need Jesus. We go through struggles. We need your help, Lord. Pour out your spirit on your people right now. Would you come? Come on. Come on.